All right, so I wanted to make a little interlude to what we have been doing so far just to explain what degrees of freedom are. So when we're studying mechanics, we need to take into account that there are many different physical systems that will depend on how many degrees of freedom there are. So a degree of freedom, you can think of it as the different ways in which the object can move. So in the example here of this spring mass system, what you have is you have a mass attached to a spring. And now the, the only way that this actual object can move is either to the right or to the left. So there's one dimension along which it can move. So we say that this system in particular has one degree of freedom. Now if we look at the system here, even though it is still only moving in one dimension, it is a two degree of freedom system because there are two bodies that can actually move independently of one another. So we have one displacement for this object and then one displacement for this other object. And in the end, because we're taking into account just individual motions happening, then we say that this system has two degrees of freedom. Now in the same way, we could actually assume that we have the following case. So imagine that you have a flat surface and then you have something like a disk on top of it and this disk is moving to the right and it is also rotating so there's no slipping happening. Now how many degrees of freedom do you think the system has? Well, there are two essentially two ways in which this disk can move. It can either move along the x direction or it can actually move in terms of angular displacement. So there is some angular displacement happening. And in the end, we have two types of motions. We have translation and then we have rotation. But there's only one of each of those. So in the end, we say that this system here has two degrees of freedom because it is essentially free to move in two different ways and it actually moves as a combination of both. Now degrees of freedom are important because you need to identify exactly what are the equations of motion that you're going to get. Um, you can get an idea of the kind of equations of motion simply by looking at the number of degrees of freedom. So you should have an equation of motion for each degree of freedom. That's the general idea behind it. <laughs> Now, there are some cases in which things might not be as obvious as others. So I could give you this example here where you have an inclined plane and then just a mass resting on top of it. Now, if the mass starts moving along the surface here, you might think, well, there are two directions in which this is moving. This is not only being displaced along the x direction, but also being displaced along the y direction. So you might be inclined to think that this system here has only two degrees of freedom. But the thing about degrees of freedom is that we can always find a way to simplify things. So in this case, in this reference frame, yes, it looks like this system has two degrees of freedom. But if we swift, if we shift the coordinate system and perhaps do something like this, let's say we rotate the coordinates and now we create a new set x prime and y prime. Then look at what happens in that case. In that new reference frame, this mass is only moving along the direction parallel to the surface. It is not really moving a perpendicular to it. So you might think, well, which one is the correct one to choose in this case? And it turns out that you can choose either. But in general, what simplifies your analysis is the minimum amount of degrees of freedom in a system. So if you can go from two degrees of freedom to one degree of freedom, then that means that you can pretty much simplify the calculations and you can simplify the whole process of deriving equations using Lagrangian mechanics. So in general, we tend to do this kind of thing. If we find a way to reduce the number of degrees of freedom in the system, perhaps by some coordinate transformation, then we do so first and then we apply the analysis. And you find out that it actually is quite a simplification. <clears throat> so this kind of thing is really useful to do sometimes. And we will do some examples with this later on just to show you exactly what this whole process looks like. In general, it doesn't matter whether you solve it using this reference frame or that reference frame because Lagrangian mechanics actually works in any reference frame. It is invariant of coordinate systems. But you will find out that 
by reducing the number of degrees of freedom, you actually simplify the problem and make it easier for you to derive the equations of motion. Because in the end, you know, there is a relation between this coordinate system and that. So you can just relate the coordinates of this new of those equations of motion back to the original one simply by performing a substitution. So we'll talk about that um, as well. Now let me give you another example. So we're going to have something like a simple pendulum. And this is exactly what we analyzed in the previous video. We had a mass hanging from a rod, and then the rod it was just oscillating back and forth. Now you might think, well, if you look at the problem from the reference frame of the bob, you might be inclined to say that it is actually moving in two directions. So in that case, you might say, well, it is moving in, it has two degrees of freedom, right? It's moving along the x direction, along the y direction as well. But there is also another possibility. If you look at the whole system as just a single arm that is just swinging back and forth about a fixed pivot point, then what you notice is that you can express the total motion of that system in terms of that angular displacement. So instead of taking into account two degrees of freedom, you can take into account the angular displacement or rotational motion. And this is essentially going to give you what you need in order to analyze the problem and make it a lot simpler. So in general, we prefer to just go with the minimum amount of degrees of freedom. So look for the minimum number, look how you, uh, how you can simplify the problem before even starting to solve it. And then you'll see that the process is a lot quicker and a lot easier. So in the same manner, I could give you the following. I could give you a double pendulum system, and this is something that we will also study in this uh, playlist. So you're going to have two angles, something like this. You have two masses here. Now you will think, well, maybe this has four degrees of freedom. This one can move in two ways. This one can move in two ways. But we know that we can completely characterize the motion of both simply by using their angular displacement because they're rotating about fixed points. This one is rotating about a fixed point. This one is rotating about this one's frames of reference, but as far as it is concerned, it is fixed with respect to this one. So in this case, we still have two degrees of freedom. So that's the general idea behind this. We, we try to simplify the domain of the problem simply by counting how many ways can the, the body or the multi-body system that we're studying move. And then we simply use uh, our common sense to say, well, maybe we can simplify this further if we perform some kind of coordinate transformation. Or there might be cases in which you simply cannot reduce the number of degrees of freedom, so you just have to analyze it as it is. But this is a really important concept to talk about because we will have to use it quite a lot when deriving equations of motion.